It is um, really a pleasure. One of the things that um, has been a delight is we've put this conference together. It's been the opportunity for all of us to reflect on uh, the amazing impact that Jerry has had um, on each of us. And I think um, those of us on the faculty here have um, all reflected fondly. And as we were thinking about who should give the opening keynote, um, none other than my friend and colleague, Yohai Benkler. Uh, Yohai, as many of you know, um, has um, been an intellectual force, um, not only in uh, the field of IP, as such, but really in looking at how technology and capitalism and certainly today the platform economy has produced both inequity and equality and continues to disrupt um, and refine um, our expectations um, um, in a democratic society. And so we asked him in light of Jerry's commitment to um, the public welfare, um, Jerry's uh, deep convictions about equality and Jerry's concern um, about fairness in the markets uh, to speak and to give the opening keynote to this address to this um, audience. And so it is with pleasure and fondness that I welcome Yohai Benkler uh, to give us the opening keynote. Thanks, Ruth. It's, it's, uh, um, when Ruth asked me to, to give this talk, I said, look at the list of people here. <laughs> what do I know about IP? These are the people who really know what they're talking about. What, what can I do? And, and really, I understood in some sense that when we have a fest drift like this, um, it's, a, it's a process of gift giving. We're saying thank you to Jerry for all the gifts you've given us for years. Um, uh, and these gifts are, are your intellectual work and your contributions, as, as, as Terry outlined uh, uh, initially. Um, and the way we're really doing this, it seems, is that each one of us is bringing, here's my new thing. Let's unwrap it together and enjoy reciprocally each other's intellectual pressures, each other's efforts to understand. And that that's our real way of saying thank you and giving respect to an academic is to say, here's what we're doing. Uh, so I won't apologize anymore. Uh, uh, and I'll just uh, launch into it. But particularly, I think, because uh, a, a chunk of what I'm trying to do now is understand what the practices of this community, of the us that are sitting here, uh, teach us about how to think about one of the great challenges the democratic societies face now, which is inequality. Uh, and I would say, and I will try to persuade you, uh, and I'll skip a little bit because we had a longer break uh, of, uh, than, as long a break as we needed and a longer one than scheduled. Um, so apologies for when I skip through things. Um, uh, you'll just have to trust me or not. Um, uh, but I want to keep us back on time. Uh, but the basic uh, um, uh, claim that I'm going to try to present to you is that the present range of work, on one hand, on the economics of inequality, when it considers technology, is wrong. And on the other hand, that the work we've done, in particular the non-theorized, actual, practical, political work that so many people here have done, uh, offers us a very different theory of the relationship between technology and inequality. Uh, and that's a story about power and power seeking and how it plays out in society to reach um, 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 inequality. So, we're all familiar with this kind of graph, some version of it using uh, uh, population growth as a measure of welfare that sees everything from the first agricultural revolution on as relatively static, and then a massive inflection upwards with the second agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, um, plotting technological changes that are continuously making us healthier, um, uh, better fed, uh, better moved, so that we can move forward. And this core role of technology in improving human welfare is measured by total population. We also have our own version that we've all been working on it. Moore's Law and the, uh, uh, our own moment carries that same exponential growth through IT and everything around it. And we all know the stories that it will give us Watson uh, as AI into personalized medicine, and it will give us uh, individualized uh, sequencing, and it will give us the connected, connected mobility all over the place, and it will have uh, robots that will do things, and all will be well. There are a bunch of things that push back. 
The first is the uncomfortable fact that productivity growth since 1973, except for a brief eight-year period, has actually been much lower than historical periods. Uh, so if this is 48 to 73 in terms of annual productivity growth, and Robert Gordon tells us this goes back to 1880 really, what we've seen since 73 to today is essentially much lower productivity growth average per annum, except for a brief period where first IP producing firms and then IT consuming firms had a one-time positive shock in productivity. This goes now all the way to 2018 and suggests that the average is even uh, lower. So productivity growth is actually slower. Uh, we see measures of business dynamism, proportion of firms that are younger than five years is actually going down since the 70s. Proportion, share of employees employed by young firms is going down uh, in the long term. Uh, uh, that's inconsistent with our story. Uh, we're seeing concentration, uh, market concentration, uh, responding to deregulation very quickly with entry of new firms and decrease, but then starting in the 90s, continuing to grow across multiple sectors and industries as firm reconsolidate. Of course, people in our field looking at telecommunications, looking at the internet, we know what the behemoths are that have developed, but this turns out to be true across the economy. And perhaps most damningly, markups in the economy in the US have been going up consistently since 1980s, which is to say, rent extraction is becoming a larger component of profit making in the economy since the 1980s. That's a very different story from a story of technological innovation that increases productivity and with it increases welfare. Over the same period, we've seen this phenomenon of the rise, particularly in the United States and the US, not at all um, uh, in Europe, the rise of the uh, top decile, which when we look and break it down is almost not at all the 90th to 95th percentile, a little bit 95th to 99th, and almost all 99th percentile. So a massive increase in share uh, going to the top 1%, complete flatlining of real median income down here, and the result being essentially that white non-Hispanic uh, 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 whites in the United States are the only population in the developed world that has seen its mortality rise and longevity fall since 1993, overwhelmingly through diseases of despair, suicide, cirrhosis from drinking, and uh, opioid overdoses. Something is happening that is not consistent with this technology is moving things forward. And the question that I'm going to, and, and as a result, what we've seen, at least as partially a result, this profound economic insecurity, compounded by, economic, by identity threat, I don't want to understate it, but profound economic insecurity uh, has led to dramatic rebellion against the elites that produce this narrative of growing technology, growing productivity, trickle down to everyone, fundamentally disruptive democratic societies as we know them. And so what I'm going to try to do very briefly is answer the first question uh, what role, if any, has technology got to do with rising inequality? But in the process of asking that, I'm going to try to give us a set of ways of thinking about how, in general, we think about the role of technology and innovation in an economy that we understand as functioning in relation to power and where power plays a large and substantial and continuing role in the construction of markets, in deciding who produces what, who gets what out of production, what gets produced, how it gets produced, uh, rather than not. So let me start with uh, what is today, I'd say, the consensus view, uh, certainly was true until three or four years ago, the consensus view in policy elites had technology playing a central role and did not come out of innovation economics or IP economics, it came out of labor economics. And the basic story was a very simple one. Technology marches to the beat of its own drum. It's exogenous and deterministic. It has certain characteristics that are true of it internally. These interact as capital in efficient labor markets with labor, such that different kinds of labor become more or less productive depending on the capital they're using. And then the labor market rewards those differently able workers differentially. And the thing that's happened is that technology has become skilled bias. 
in the canonical form, developed initially by Larry Katz, most developed currently by Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. In the canonical form, the basic story is monotonic. The more skilled people are, the more they can adapt to changing technology. And so, uh, as, and so rent, uh, um, um, college premium uh, rises, and, and income rises in education as technology is driving these differential returns. This fit the data in the 1980s beautifully in the United States because the 50-10 ratio was growing, the 90-50 ratio was growing. Uh, they were both growing and they were both related uh, to education. Uh, the critical point here that institutions here play a relatively limited role and as technology progresses, the thing we need to do is educate workers to fit the technology as it moves along. Uh, better. This didn't quite fit the story in the 1990s where the 50-10 ratio actually collapsed and, 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 the, ten, and, and the 50 flatlined and the 10 uh, came up and you needed something non-monotonic and then what was developed in the early 2000s was called the tasks framework. And here again, technology is exogenous. It is deterministic in its characteristics. Some things are easier to automate, other things are less easy. Routine things are easy to automate, non-routine things are hard to automate. The middle class jobs, the people doing, um, uh, the people uh, in the back office of the, of the CPA, uh, were, their jobs were now being done by Excel sheets, they were losing jobs. Uh, the people who were working on the assembly line were being replaced by robots. The non-routine people, the janitor who had to deal with uh, floors that were not regular and robots couldn't quite see well enough. The CPA was now using Excel. Those were getting much higher. So you saw rises at the top and the bottom and hollowing out in the middle. This was great for the 1990s in the US. It didn't quite explain the 80s, uh, which were monotonic rise. It didn't quite explain the 2000s, which saw nobody rise except for a little bit on the bottom. It certainly didn't fit the overall uh, uh, um, differences between different countries all at the same technological frontier that didn't all see the same changes. And so it came under substantial empirical uh, threat as more data from more countries and over more time was being collected. But it remained a very intuitive and, and critical uh, um, um, framework. Uh, again, with this very simple technology exogenous and deterministic, markets are more or less efficient and deterministic at equilibrium <coughs> clearing labor and uh, society essentially has to either adapt or decline. It becomes the template of the model of the kinds of discussions we've seen over robots will take all the work, uh, Uberize, Uber will routinize and, 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 and um, um, uh, make precarious all jobs as a matter of technological efficiency because those firms will be more productive. Uh, and obviously the last three or four years have seen a lot of pushback on that narrative, but I'd say that was the dominant narrative for two or three years from about, let's say, 2012 to 2015, 2016. Um, the most powerful counter-narrative also within labor economics came from institutionalists. Uh, their basic claims were a whole bunch of institutions as a result of politics uh, led to substantial shift of bargaining power between labor and capital, between labor and management, between the financial industries and non-financial industries. These involved both directly questions of financial regulation and product market regulation that allowed for concentration, uh, but also increases in trade and globalization in a way that allowed free movements of good and capital but not people, which created opportunities to create new competition in labor markets, in the wealthier economies competing against poorer economies, offshoring, outsourcing, and then organizational adaptations of perm attempts as well. Here, it's a strong institutional story. Technology plays no role. And so the question is, for us coming to this conversation, where do we stand? People who do law, who do institutions, but also believe that technology has a fundamental role. How do we understand our role and our scholarship in relation to this conversation that has dominated the conversation about the sources of inequality? Um, <clears throat> Let me skip through this. Uh, I'd say this. Let me describe to you two very, I think, familiar forms of uh, innovation, economics, and intellectual property scholarship. And then one practice that if, it looks, if I look at you and you don't say, ah, that's where I was, then I've failed because I've learned from the wrong things. I've learned from the wrong experiences. Looking at you, Pam. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Classic incentives access model, 
having a, a neoclassical version that's more about property creates incentives and suffers from the standard incentive access uh, trade-off of public goods versus a neo-Schumpeterian, rents don't come from property, rents come from market structure, patents are less important, uh, market structure is more important, and there if you're focusing on law, you're focusing more on antitrust, um, and, and knowing that it's public goods, you have a state version of it, uh, so uh, um, um, Ken Arrow starting already, you need investment because you're going to get underinvestment and underutilization uh, if you have strong patents, uh, national innovation systems, uh, and trading off. So Dick, N Dick Nelson's, if you're talking about the Nutrient Patent side, Dick Nelson and the trade-offs between public. Uh, I'm, I'm necessarily using older things just to sort of, I see the heads, people know what I'm talking about. Um, and similar with regard to markets, where either they're more or less competitive or they're a higher or lower deadweight loss based on the incentive taxes pattern uh, uh, trade-off. Critically for markets, the content remains exogenous, but the rate is endogenous to the institutions adopted in the market. Whereas in the state, it's intended to have an endogenous uh, effect on the technology. You're essentially talking about industrial policies and building national industry. Now, that's in the innovation economic side. In our literature, I certainly have done work in this vein. Um, uh, if you think of work that, that, that Jerry's done, some of it, I think the, the, the Jerry, Pam, Randy, Mitch, the, the manifesto was in that, let's get there. I think a lot of the things that Terry was talking about with regard to Jerry, whether it's legal hybrids, whether it's tulips, sounds in this. Let's get a better innovation system by designing institutions without focusing necessarily on the distributive questions, getting to a better system that produces better innovation. Complementing this, again, for many of us in the room, and, and, and this was the first thing that Terry emphasized in Jerry's work, is distribution-sensitive innovation policy. In this context, primarily about access, availability of the outcomes, the ways in which it's more in the mode of accepting a market society and looking for redistribution of access through rules rather than the other way around. Obviously, access to medicines, the kinds of concerns that Bhavan was raising uh, uh, in his sense with regard to TRIPS were central here. Uh, and here again, you have the literature about the state, about public research, uh, prizes, et cetera. You have the concerns here with market failures, not in the sense that market failures in the classic sense, but that markets will systematically not deliver certain kinds of goods, tropical diseases, orphan diseases. I'm going quickly because I'm seeing from the nods, I'm just using, I'm, I'm high compression. Uh, <laughs> And again, obviously, as Terry said, this is stuff you see in Jerry's uh, uh, work, Central. Bhavan had, had quoted um, uh, free riders and fair followers. Keith talked about his uh, uh, collaborations with, with Jerry. Here, quite centrally, uh, the question of distribution is front and center. But it's understood not just as subsidies around, but as how do you treat the rules as causing maldistribution along known dimensions. And the interventions are, are there rule-based redistribution, as it were, if you will, pre... I hate this term. I won't use it. I won't say the one I won't use. Uh, it's about how to structure markets and how to structure, more importantly, innovation systems to deliver outcomes that are not maldistributed. The whole class of work of people, uh, uh, and I'm not going to... Um, um, I, I could. You're here. Uh, now, next to this... Um, um, let's call it uh, fellow travelers, people who are looking, looking at technology rather than at IP, more sounding in science, technology, society in some cases than in, in economics or law, uh, focusing, starting with Langdon winners, do artifacts have, pol have, have politics, which is the standard, Helen Nissenbaum's work with Batya Friedman on, on um, uh, uh, bias in computer uh, systems and, and, and later on values in design. Uh, in, in our community, Larry Lessig's code is obviously the, the one that had the most influence. The critical point is that technologies settle social conflicts, whether it's the Long Island parkways that segregated through architecture approaches to the beaches uh, on Long Island, whether it's um, 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 late 19th century machines that were less productive than the craft union workers, but broke the craft unions and then made way for the de-skilling of labor. All of these are situations where technology is intentionally developed.
to resolve social conflict in favor of the party implementing the technology. <clears throat> and this is where I said, if you don't recognize yourself here, I'm in trouble, I have to rewrite the paper. So if you look at the actual copyright wars of the last 25 years, at the battles over patents, at the battles over uh, uh, at TRIPS and the WIPO treaties, um, uh, the experience and writing of this community is one that suggests much more active, knowing, strategic action, both by firms and by individuals, acting alone and acting collectively through bodies, to shape the context that they understand will give them greater or lesser market power in the context of a market-based economy. Particularly on the side of firms, there is rent-seeking aimed to achieve by increasing the magnitude of the quasi-rents they get from being first or in a market and increasing its half-life so that they can capture those rents for longer. Whereas for individuals, you either get freedom-oriented uh, drivers, you get certain social, uh, uh, other social values um, that were uh, pushed. So that means that individuals, so free software, um, um, PGP for purposes of dealing with surveillance, all of these are intentional interventions to structure technologies of freedom into the system to nullify state captured, what were understood to be captured state actors trying to do some, the opposite, trying to essentially allow capture. On the other hand, you see the strategic lobbying on DRM, on the WIPO treaties, etc., aimed precisely to create technologies that would allow incumbents to control entrance. You see it today in the battles over, uh, uh, over um, um, surveillance capitalism and the concern with, with uh, manipulating consumer demand. Uh, so you see essentially a model of understanding markets as arenas of negotiating power in context, where actors play both in context, spend some of their rents, some of their energy in context to grab a part of the rents, and some of their rents on context to create the next round's context to make it easier to extract rent uh, the next time. Uh, and so, uh, and so essentially, in this context, uh, technology is endogenous uh, uh, and plastic. By endogenous, as, as you already see, technology is part of the process of seeking power. It's plastic in the sense that it's not that anything, you can do anything with any technology, it's all socially constructed. But there's enough play in the joints that how it's designed and how it's developed makes a huge difference. And that can make a huge difference for bargaining and distribution issues down the line. Markets are generally not efficient. Uh, uh, power therefore matters, and institutions, technology, and ideology are three domains in which uh, action is, is uh, played out to um, uh, achieve better outcomes. So um, again, I, I, uh, I skimmed over this, the role that academics have played in the construction of knowledge. You basically have hired scholarship on one side, trying to create the knowledge tools with which you can justify certain extractive practices. And on the other side, you have um, uh, other institutions, in this case academics, trying to do something else. If you look at, at Paul and Jerry's uh, uh, culturally reconstructed commons or the work on data and the relationship between, uh, uh, between science, academic science, and, and innovation, that's exactly the kind of work that I'm talking about as strategic intellectual intervention to shape the knowledge framework so as to shape the institutional framework, understanding that it has a real difference in terms of who gets to act in favor of what in society. Um, and essentially what I uh, uh, suggest is that we have a micro-foundational framework a meso framework and a macro framework through which to understand this. The micro foundational framework is essentially, as I just said, it's quasi rent seeking, where you understand that profits come from rents that accrue for a period until competition comes in. Now, that's the standard understanding in New Schumpeterian economics for why we have innovation. You want to be first to market, you create the market, you garner the rents for a while until somebody catches up. That's the story. Rents are not bad. Rents are what drives innovation. The question is how high they are and how long they are and what you're doing to increase their magnitude and their longevity, their half-life. 
The second is you act collectively in conscious ways. This is, as I said, this is the RIAA, this is the, the various business alliances, but it's also the social movements, it's also the free culture movement, it's also the massive organization uh, uh, by academics, um, whether it's the amicus briefs uh, that you write, whether it's the, the, the interventions in, in public legislation, all of which are essentially collective action at the meso level where networks of people come together and know each other and continuously fight on the other side because they're there as real social actors. Um, and finally, we have emergent patterns at the macro level that are probably best explained by the new institutionalism in sociology, models where models of practice become isomorphic across organizations, across networks of people through imitation, through victory, through what becomes normal as practice to do, such that you don't actually need the micro-foundational story to carry all the way through and every firm to act that way. You can incorporate non-agency, but rather structural moves of populations uh, over time, as long as you have some of this micro-foundational move. So to get us back on time, I apologize, I'm going to uh, go through some more of these things. I want to show two more images and close there. The first is, this is the way I think of the micro-foundational component only. Remember, I think there's a micro, meso, and macro. The micro-foundational, just looking at the firm rather than firm and individuals, just looking at the micro. Think of every firm as facing a choice of action in any given context. It can do stuff that increases its productivity and therefore makes it more competitive, and it can do stuff that reduces its competition that contains its competition, that makes it demand for its products less, uh, uh, less elastic um, uh, and have fewer substitutes. And at each choice point, it can invest the next dollar in one or the other. Each of these pathways has technology and institutions as part of what they're investing in. Each of these pathways has, um, uh, uh, has uh, 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 ideology as well in terms of trying to buy knowledge to secure their positions. And essentially, they're constantly trading off uh, deploying technological and institutional options to shape future rents. So what does that look like as a practical matter? Uh, you're looking to increase entry barriers to competitors in the market in order to increase your rents. You're looking to prevent entry by innovators in order to increase the half-life of your rents. You're trying to increase competition among workers uh, so that they have less bargaining power and you can extract a higher portion of the joint product. You're looking to disrupt collective action, both by workers and consumers, again, in order to preserve uh, bargaining power. And you're looking to manipulate demand in order to uh, uh, make it harder for consumers to look for something else and harder to appreciate the differences between these two. Each of these you do um, either te by technology or any one of these other measures. What does that look like as a practical matter? Think of it as extractive technologies in the firm in its various relationships to others. So if you think of DRM or the Terminator gene or, 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 or uh, 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 rent maximizing price discrimination, all of these are mechanisms of controlling demand and disabling uh, uh, competition. If you look at demand shaping technologies, I think that's central to the work Shoshana Zubo's focusing now, Julie Cohen's focusing now. Um, all of these go to consumers and ultimately probably this is stuff that I've been doing a lot in the last three years, shaping citizens and political processes. Uh, but also the work, so uh, I don't know if Josh is still here, Josh's focus on standard setting organizations in, in the prior panel is about strategic intervention in standard setting as well as deploying non-standard technologies. All of the battles over standards are very much about being able to create power of incumbents uh, and exclude competitors and exclude innovators. And then of course there's a lot of older work on ways in which technology is used to de-skill and homogenize labor in order to decrease the bargaining power of labor, to monitor labor. So if you look at Karen Levy's work on, on trucking now uh, is a classic example. Uh, uh, keystroke loggers since the 1980s, et cetera. Uh, and finally, labor disrupting. So if you look at, say, Mary Gray's uh, 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 book now on ghost work, on the structure of the platforms, making it much harder for people to organize, the ways in which people are complaining about the structure of the Uber framework to make it harder for workers to organize. So in this context, technology is deployed partly, and this is the thing I'm trying to put, this is not just about extraction. Partly it's in order to increase productivity. There continues to be the drive of the market. 
to do something more, but partly to strategically grab rents. And you can extract this and say, this happens at the level of institutions, it happens at the level of technology, and it happens at the level of ideology, as well as some price strategies, which I, I consider less. In each of these relations, the objective is to decrease competition, decrease entry, increase the life, uh, the, the size and half-life of the strategies, and um, uh, increase the rate of rates, while at the same time, once you've created this larger set of rents, you uh, have more bargaining power to capture it. So this is what I'm, I, I call the Red Queen plays Vulcan chess. Uh, if you think of, of, of the Red Queen as this is the place where you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in place uh, in Alice in Wonderland, that's the beneficial role of markets. It's the whip of competition that leads us to productivity. It's the promise of that starting inflection point that with, with competition will come investment in technology, increases in productivity, and with it well-being. But there's a constant trade-off where firms are trying to escape the Red Queen dynamic, slow everybody else down so that they can capture more rents, and they're doing it by playing in multiple domains of action, institutions, technology, and ideology, wherever they can most slow everybody else down and extract a larger uh, portion of the rents. This story easily knits together all these observations. How do we see dramatic technological innovation in the leading sector combined with slower formation of firms, higher markups, higher concentration in markets. All of this is entirely consistent with the story. Yes, firms are innovating in ways that increase their rents. Specifically, once the state is removed as a counterpower through the process of liberalization and deregulation, once unions are weakened through the process of labor law that undermines unions, firms can dedicate more of their resources to the rent-seeking and rent-extraction side of the equation over the uh, productivity. And that's how you can get both technological growth of great and increase in rents. And unsurprisingly, in that context, that larger pie is put in the pockets of the very few who can control this system, while at the same time leaving in economic insecurity everyone else. That's my story. And I got us back on time. Yes, you did. Um, although I suspect we'll go a few minutes over because I suspect that there are lots of people who want to probe your story that you're sticking to um, more deeply. So let's take a few questions, um, get the debate going. Obviously, Yohai has been, as always, uh, provocative, um, deeply insightful, and I think troubled by something that has um, been evident in much of Jerry's scholarship. So, Jerry, do you have a question for Yohai? Uh, we'd like you to start. Well, what's, the, what's the recommendation? What's the rule? What's the, you have the state receives as a counter power, but uh, will the state be, can that be remedied if, uh, <laughs> if the forces that control that recession control the uh, repowerization? <laughs> Uh, so, uh, uh, <laughs> what does our new tool know how to do, <laughs> is Jerry's very practical question. Um, um, I think, I think uh, this intervention is intended at at least two levels. Uh, the first one is, as I say, I think knowledge production is part of the process, and having a different story about how um, uh, technology works, um, opens up avenues. I think many regulators today are still highly constrained by the fear that they will upset, that, that, that they will upset the apple cart, that, that if they're not technology neutral in their regulation, or if they uh, pressure technology firms too much, they will lose. That's changing, I'd say, uh, in the last three or four years. Uh, but not for much longer. 
I'd still say if I go to a conference of people doing smart city and city governments, they're still told by everyone, you either get with the program or, or you're going to be a backwater. Um, uh, and so having a better story that we are comfortable with that understands why there are real structural distributive things at play in technology policy, and it's not just about more is better, but how really matters dramatically, that's one part of, of, of it, and it's putting the distribution center. I'd say it's also uh, trying to invite some of the scholarship that's in distribution sensitive innovation policy into looking um, um, not only at distribution of outcomes, but at uh, more or less extractive market structures and how they play back into even within the developed economies as opposed to developing even where the economy is working as it should. Uh, so that's one line of things. Um, the second line of things, I think, is that um, uh, it's to uh, invite, as it were, a multi-system a multi approach, right? understanding how your particular intervention, no, I'll say, I'm going on too long, I'll say the thing that is, for me, the most sort of look in the mirror and worry. I spent plenty of time, as you know, being skeptical about the state and trying to find arrangements outside of the state and trying to find self-organizing frameworks. Uh, I'd say the free software movement was very much about trying to do, uh, to roll our own. Um, I think we need to look at it and say, that's not good enough. Uh, we need to build, now, that's not to suddenly have, be nostalgic about how wonderful the regulatory period of the 1950s and 60s were. There are excellent reasons why that model of regulation lost out across uh, the developing world. And so we need to build new frameworks that will allow the state to be more effective without falling into the same bureaucratization problems that there are. That becomes a central institutional design problem that we need to solve, how we build genuinely democratically, democratically accountable but flexible sources of counterpower. And so again, as you're trying to think of, here's my intervention, what's the coalition around it? Who are the states that actually can do this? What sort of people do I, what sort of actors do I have that can actually balance the counterpower? What interventions can I have that I'm not thinking of as innovation policy, but will undermine something within the financial limit management of markets to actually weaken some of the power of the states? This is, this is, this is what I'm hoping uh, will be a practical outcome in terms of what things we consider to be connected to each other. Uh, in determining the shape of inequality in different societies. Yoka, this was very thought-provoking as usual. I appreciate all of the taxonomies that you've created and sort of described to us. One question, it, the, builds on your comment or your observation that rent extraction per se is not necessarily bad. And you know the question is what is done with that extracted rent? Is it, is it going to be reinvested in the kinds of R&D and you know, innovation sort of generating uh, technologies, right, that might lead to more growth, more inclusion of labor and all of that sort of wonderful stuff that we want to see, the sort of the growth at the same time that we see the lessening of inequalities. And so I know based on um, sort of some, of some of Craig Christensen's follow-up to his disruptive innovation idea, he has actually documented how a lot of that accumulated capital is just tightly held onto, it's not reinvested. And he also makes a distinction between sort of efficiency uh, types of innovations as opposed to productivity enhancing. I don't know what his exact words are, but more inclusive. So innovations that actually then lead to more employment as opposed to less. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. My question, my question may be related, and that, that was thought-provoking, but also very quick, so sorry if I, if I missed this. But, I mean, how much of the issue, I mean, you, you focused on distribution and, and rent-seeking in the world. How much of the issue here, or how, how much, in your view, is, uh, you know, that in some sense technology policy or innovation policy, including, you know, patent policy and some of the other things, are more focused on the rate of 
innovation than the direction of innovation um, and you know you know how much do we want to or are even capable of kind of directing the types of innovation that would kind of generate the social outcomes that, that we want so. yeah um, so actually I, I agree those are those are uh, related and and uh, certainly to me one of the uh, one of the outcomes of understanding these things in this way is to get comfortable in nudging uh, technological development at roughly the same components into slightly different assemblages that have different uh, structures. So you could imagine taking the components that make, um, and that, I'm not ignoring, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Um, 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 you can imagine taking the components that make robotics uh, into different assemblages, one of which will have one doctor and several robotic nurses uh, with a very highly structured framework. The other, a, um, um, a highly enabled class of uh, highly skilled but not physician licensed skilled people working with data, with diagnostics, etc., to actually provide much greater access to health at lower costs. Which of these two goes forward is a legitimate policy orientation, not only from the perspective of health delivery, but also from the, expect the, the perspective of labor market framework. So what I'm suggesting here, I'd say the biggest takeoff in that, take home from this, is that there is no reason to think that a market-driven choice between those two options will be optimized by just focusing on rate of innovation. And when we just do technology that's very narrowly focused on an idea of rate of innovation, based on letting market actors choose whatever they want to choose, we actually are not doing our jobs because we're leaving a too wide of a range of options with vastly different social and political consequences uh, in ways that, as we're seeing now democratically, could end up being extremely disruptive. If you play the politics 15 years down, the power of labor 15 years after you've gone the doctor with robotic nurses versus the physician's assistants with Watson in their pocket is completely different. The alliances and political coalitions for the next round of innovation is completely different. And to that, I think, and again, to me, if you're thinking innovation policy, and even if you're just focused on patents, understanding how that relates to this broader framework may force you sometimes to say, no, this isn't enough. I have to see how it interacts with these other things um, and, and worry if all it's going to do is give power to a certain set of market incumbents to direct the direction of innovation in a way that is ultimately not only unjust but politically destabilizing. Well, Professor Reichman, you um, have the last word. If you have anything else, we will wrap up this session. Your, your analysis, as always, is uh, extremely brilliant and uh, uh, enlightening. The, the ability to find ways to react to it, <laughs> given the structures that self-reinforce uh, constantly, is, uh, is, a, is, yeah. is a question. Where is this enlightenment going to come from, and, and especially if you can't rely on uh, the point you make as a state recedes as a counterpower. I think there you need a dot, dot, dot. And then the question is, who is the state? And uh, what are the counterpowers that uh, are On that, I'll say this just very briefly. Um, I think you look at the politics of the Democratic Party today. Uh, they're very different from the way they were 25 years ago in terms of a desire. Doesn't mean that it'll be done competently but a desire to reintroduce the state into the process. If you think of the idea of the Green New Deal as a fundamentally connected technology and social policy combined, that's a very different model. If you look at the much more assertive position that the European Commission is taking in regulating tech today than was the case 10, 15 years ago, where there was a lot more database rights you want, Sure, forget about what these people are writing. Uh, let's get, you want a little heaping, heaping right of monopoly? Sure, why don't I give you another? So, so I, I think we're beginning to be there, and now we need to build the tools to understand what does a, what? Exactly. The institutional tools, they could eventually evolve into the counterpower. 
Exactly. Okay. Exactly. The institutional tools that could eventually evolve into the counterpower. Yohai, thank you so much for giving oh, us pleasure. more than enough to think about for the rest of many of our careers. Thank you. <laughs>